Right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to um, Insight 2020. We are here today to talk about homelessness and COVID-19 and how to use, how we can work together to use research to learn in a crisis. I'm Janine Della. I work at the Strategy Unit. I'm chairing today, so I'm here with no knowledge of the topic as, at okay. all and hoping to learn an awful lot today. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to the session, then I'll hand over to our expert panel. Um, we've got a lively interactive discussion format today, so use the interactive chat um, to raise your questions and join in with the conversation. Um, and hopefully we're all going to learn an awful lot about homelessness. So just to give you a very quick introduction, um, our, this festival is about using research and analysis to help decision makers to make the best decisions that they can. Week four is a bit of a deviation. It's purely focused on health and equality. So we've got lots of sessions looking at health inequalities, how COVID is widening health inequalities and how it's impacting differently on different segments of the population. This session is an opportunity to reflect on lessons from having done research on homelessness and response to COVID-19. So obviously homelessness, people who are homeless are our most vulnerable in society. And we made some radical changes during lockdown and beyond. Um, the services for people experiencing homelessness altered significantly, um, especially during everyone in and health and care services had to be able to act in a different way to support um, these vulnerable populations. Some of the changes that we made were good for some people, some were experienced positively, others were less so. So how do we take some of the learning from reacting at the crisis point to understand how we can ch change services and adapt services to understand which ones we should keep, which ones should we drop, should we drop and which ones need further study. So we've got, has that changed? Yes, we've got four fantastic speakers here today. We've got um, Olivia from NHS EI, who is here as a senior decision maker, seeking to influence other decision makers. Um, so she, Olivia, was after more systematic inf information about what was being done in response to COVID-19, how are services changing, how were people experiencing them, what opportunities were created to change health and care provision, and are there any changes that we could turn into mainstream provision? Um, so this is all really, really difficult in a crisis, but the best thing we can do is learn from what's happened and learn what we can do differently going forward. We've also got two speakers from Brownswell. We've got Jenny McAteer and Joe Brown. Um, Joe's going to talk first and Jenny's going to wrap up for us, but Brownswell are an organisation that are committed to ensuring that the voices of people experiencing homelessness are heard. And Groundswell were commissioned by Olivia to gather views through peer research. So um, an opportunity to hear what they found out from that research. We've also got Fraser Batai from the Strategy Unit. Um, he was also commissioned by Olivia to understand what services were doing and what services, what stakeholders thought about them. So a really good opportunity to kind of hear from our four speakers, um, they'll all have 10 minutes each and um, actually have a bit of a conversation about this as we run through. So just before I hand over to our first speaker, who is Olivia from NHSEI, just for a reminder of our ground rules, which I'm not going to um, read out to you, but we will um, pop the hashtag if you want to tweet about the session into the chat so that you've got that. Um, I'll just leave the ground rules up for a couple of minutes before I stop sharing so that you can have your speakers on full screen and I will hand over now to Olivia to talk to us about the evidence around homelessness. Thanks so much Janine. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. Um, so my name is Olivia Butterworth. Um, I work for NHS England and Improvement. 
in normal times, whatever that time might look like again in the future, my job is um, head of public participation. So it's very focused on how do we involve people and communities in the design development um, and delivery of NHS and care services. Um, involving people is literally essential if we're actually going to address health inequalities. And I'm not sure that most people really make that link. Um, I think traditionally we look at involving people as we get people into a room and we ask them what they think about things that we've generally already decided. And we might tweak around with them a little bit, but generally speaking, it's a little bit at the end of the process rather than at the beginning. And we really want to shift people into working in partnership with people and communities because it's their experience, it's their lives that we are privileged to be able to support. But we have to recognise we don't know their lives, we don't live their lives, we all live our own lives. The only way we can start to understand that and start to understand the barriers to care, um, to start to understand why people don't access services, how services aren't working for them and how services are working for them, is to talk to them. Um, it's not rocket science, but it's not commonly done. Um, so at the start of COVID, right back at the beginning of March, um, I ha I'd just been to the Pathway Conference um, because we've been doing a lot of work with primary care networks around how primary care networks engage with people and communities um, with a particular lens on um, very vulnerable inclusion health groups. So people experiencing homelessness, asylum seekers, refugees, gypsies and travellers, um, you know, people who sit on the edge of society that society doesn't necessarily embrace um, and certainly those those groups find access to services incredibly difficult. I came back from the Pathway Conference um, having had the fear of God put at me quite frankly by um, Professor um, Andrew Hayward and Dr Al Story who'd been doing a lot of work looking at what had been going on in Italy, what had been going on in other countries and therefore what did we need to do as, as the UK, as England, in order to protect people who were rough sleeping. Um, and it was very clear that unless we did something, people were going to die um, and die in significant numbers. Um, so I started bashing off emails saying, hi, NHS England colleagues, who actually leads on homelessness? And I got kind of a resounding, we don't know. We don't know who leads on homelessness, um, which kind of set alarm bells ringing to start with, because if nobody's looking at this, if nobody's thinking about it, these invisible people will continue to be invisible through a global pandemic and they will die. Um, that then resulted in a phone call that said, Olivia, we think that you should lead on homelessness. And I went, OK, um, yeah. Um, oh, right. Um, crap. Why did I ask the question? I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Um, so I picked it up from really nowhere with having a few contacts, a few people. I know a lot of voluntary sector colleagues. So my starting place was really to reach out and go, OK, what's going on? Um, who knows what's happening? Who's doing stuff? Who's not doing stuff? Um, and we very quickly identified leads in each of the NHSEI regional teams um, and they started to connect out into their systems and locally. What was very apparent to me, because, because of the job that I normally do, is I couldn't understand this unless I could hear the voice of people um, and have a connection to people about what they were experiencing. I was also trying to find some evidence. So, you know, where's our list of where all the inclusion health practices are across the country? Where's the great practice that we could connect with to find out what they're doing, to share with others, to get things going? None of that existed. It was a complete data desert. Um, so, and at that point, I then got a lovely email from the strategy unit saying, hi, we're here to help. How can we help you um, think about what you're doing through COVID? Um, I'd also reached out to Groundswell um, as a, a fact, they are an amazing charity. Please go and look at their website. Please look at all the monitoring uh, reports that have been published fortnightly looking at the, the, the very real issues people are experiencing and what's working for people. Um, I suppose then th 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 there's then two bits for me. So I had a conversation with Groundswell about how we make sure we link in with them. But then there's also the system data. What's actually going on in the system? How do we understand that? How do we really know? Because everything I had was based on anecdote 
and, and stories and somebody saying, yeah, this is pretty good over here. But there was nothing to actually triangulate whether that was good. Um, and even the data around the numbers was really, really difficult in terms of how many people are we talking about. Um, so quite quickly, it became really obvious that we needed to really connect the work that the strategy unit were going to do for us to look at that sort of system side, the provider, the commissioner lens on this with Groundswell's work around how does that, how does that work? How is it informed and, and really enriched by people's lived experience? And an opportunity to test those two things out. You know, do, we've, do we have a whole system that think they're brilliant and doing absolutely everything that they should be doing, but we have people with lived experience having a very different experience? Um, what, what does that look like? Um, and that's really what you're going to hear about for the rest of this session. Um, I think what's really obvious to me as we move forward is we, we've health inequalities are fundamentally important. COVID hasn't demonstrated what health inequalities are to us because if we'd really cared, we would have looked properly at Marmot 10 years ago because Marmot identified all of this 10 years ago. And in February, he published his 10 years on report. And do you know what? It's got worse. Why has it got worse? Because we really haven't paid attention to it. We have continued to not talk to the invisible people and we continue to call them hard to reach. They're not hard to reach and their lives are as valid as your life and my life. And they have absolutely the same rights to access services and support. If anything, possibly more rights because the people who've had the worst life experiences, who've been traumatised by things that have happened to them, really do need society's support and care and nurturing in order that they can progress and, and live a, a healthy and happy life. Um, and that's why we need to really think about this. And the data, the fact that the data desert exists for people who experience the greatest health inequalities is something we should all be pretty ashamed of. So if in your CCG area, you can't identify the numbers of people who are rough sleeping, who are sleeping in temporary accommodation, the number of families who are living in inappropriate accommodation, the number of Gypsy and Roma traveller people you have in your area, um, and you're not talking to them and you're not working with them around how to improve the quality of services, then we're going to continue to fail those people and those health inequalities will continue to widen. Um, so I think I'm just going to shut up there, really. Um, I might just take a bit of liberty and interrupt Joe and Fraser and Jenny as they... Um, I, want to, I want to interrupt you, Olivia, I, and I just want to, I want to try and just get a couple more minutes out of you just to talk about your role, your position as a decision maker, because I can't work out how to say this without seeming to cast aspersions on some of your colleagues perhaps, but I'll, but I'll, try, and, I'll try and do it as best I possibly can, although I'm, I'm feeling like I'm lacking the words. You're, in the nicest possible way, you strike me as being non-traditional within NHSEI. That's a, euphem that's a good euphemism for you. Really? In a sense that you've got a passion for the topic that you're, you were given charge of, and a few times when you were speaking there, you almost seemed to me to be kind of having, almost having to campaign to try to persuade other people to give this attention, to give this some focus. And it strikes me then that if that's true, we're providing you with research and analysis in that to help you make that case, to help you to attract the attention that you think needs to be made on that topic. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, so I think it is quite, I don't know my, my background I was a community development worker for years um I've I'm you know I've been an activist I'm a trustee of a charity um I, I do passionately believe that we have to address health inequalities and I equally know that we will only start to make any progress on that once we've got a, um, a, a conversation and an equal dialogue with people who experience those and we take their lives seriously without placing our generally white middle class judgments over what they should be doing. Um, so I think what we have is a system where, and I've had lots of conversations about sort of the NHS is there for everybody. It's there free at the point of need under the NHS constitution. Of course, they can access those services. 
those services aren't trauma informed if they aren't planned around people's lives if they aren't planned around where people live um, then they won't work for those people and we're making judgments and we're making decisions that aren't fully informed um, so, so actually one of the things that we're doing um, pretty rapidly over the course of the next couple of months is um, working with all directors and senior leaders across NHS England Improvement to, to do some training with them around how do they know when they're making decisions that those decisions are rooted in people's reality and where's the evidence that supports them around how they will actually reduce health inequalities because this health, reducing health inequalities is not a program that sits somewhere else. It is absolutely everybody's business. It's about how we work. It's the practice and the culture that we adopt. Um, and it's the evidence then that, that underpins all of that. So the evidence from this will provide me with, the, I suppose, the foundation of the business case about why and what we need to do moving forward. Hopefully, because it's got a nice strategy unit label on it in a way in which those senior decision makers can, can really see and connect with and, and give value to. One of the challenges we know is that, you know, across the voluntary sector, there is a wealth of research um, on very vulnerable groups experiences. There's a wealth of it out there. It's really not recognised or valued by people in the system. You know, it's not academic research. It's not been done internally by our analysts. Um, and again, we have to look at how we how we look really value that which is 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 generated in the voluntary sector. Yes, we need to challenge it. Yes, we need to to test it and and, and look at that in a in a context of what other data, what other evidence do we have that sits around it. But we can't ignore it because we ignore it at our peril. Um, and, you know, one of the things I know our population health management team are doing incredibly well is looking, certainly for primary care networks, is how do you take your population health management data about your population in your primary, net, primary care network area? And how do you contextualise that with conversations and information and data that sits outside the system? Because if we only ever plan on the data that's in the system, we will continue to miss anybody who's not registered with a GP. If you're not registered with a GP, does your, do your health needs not count? Um, so how do we get their data, um, their information into the system? Um, and, and you only really do that by bringing in that sort of the, the grade A to the qualitative research, the evidence from people's practice. And we have to give that as much weight um, in, in that sort of evidence building and policy making process. But you can't Olivia. make good policy without the evidence from people. So apologies, I'm just going to interrupt you now so that we can move on to Joe and do my chairing job. So we're going to thank you, that was brilliant. And I think one of the things that I thought was really important about the way you were talking is also language. Um, and you talked very much about people's lived experience and I've worked in the public sector for all of my now quite long career and we don't talk about people's lived experience and I do think it's something that we're missing through the whole of the COVID pandemic. We're not thinking about people's lived experience and it will be so much worse for people who are um, disadvantaged and people that we don't listen to and in particular the homeless population so we're going to hand over to Joe now who's going to talk to us about how how Groundswell have worked to make sure the voice of the people affected has been heard and the work that they have been doing to support Olivia in this journey. Thank you um, that's great yeah and I think that leads on really nicely um, to think about some of the aspects I want to talk about today and that's all around the power of peer research and, and what value that brings, especially when developing solutions. Um, so at Groundswell, if you haven't heard of us before, we're an organisation that works with people experiencing homelessness, to create solutions to homelessness. Um, we do this through a variety of ways, um, which are all peer led approaches. Um, so we have a homeless health peer advocacy service, which basically trains up people who have experienced homelessness. Um, just support people who are currently experiencing homelessness to get their health needs met, whether that's, you know, 
registering at a GP or attending a hospital appointment or just providing that support so that people feel like they can um, get their health needs met and, and have that information and support to do so. Um, we also deliver peer research. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on a bit today. Um, so I'm a research manager and, and everything that we do um, in terms of our research is led by people who have experience of homelessness. Um, we believe that you know people with experience of homelessness are best placed to develop the solutions to homelessness. Um, therefore, you know any research we do needs to be informed informed by the voices of people who have experience of homelessness themselves. Um, and like Olivia mentioned, you know this is not just in terms of a consultation with oh we found this what do you think. This is about designing research projects together, delivering it, and having people who have experience of homelessness deliver it analysing all of it together and then coming together to craft them solutions um, so that the power of kind of peer informs everything we do. And we think that's really important for, you know, there's so many reasons why um, peer research um, makes, makes research better. So as well as just breaking down that traditional power imbalance of traditional research methodologies and breaking some of that stigma, you know, it helps people to have more trust, empathy and sensitivity. Um, people are speaking the same language and you, you get more robust data, you get more robust stories from people because they have that ability to develop, develop that rapport. And also it means that the solutions that you develop, they're actually um, more appropriate and they can be implemented within the kind of real lives and the real experiences people are having. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is just an example of some of the work that we've done during COVID-19. Um, obviously, it's been quite different and we've had to shift the way that we work. Um, so our peer research process, a lot of the time would involve lots of post-it notes, flip chart paper, sitting around eating biscuits and having a discussion. Um, and that's not really been able to happen during COVID. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about how we've adapted um, that so that we can still kind of follow our values and have that participatory process whilst um, maintaining you know social distance and prevention and, and all of the other COVID um, guidelines that we've had to follow. Um, one of the things I want to mention and I think this is uh, peer research takes time um, and I think sometimes um, what you put what you put in and the time you put in is so important for what you get out and actually peer research during a pandemic takes even longer um but i would just insist and i think everyone else um all of the speakers today that it's so worthwhile um to do so so what we i i was brought on board as research manager and to start working on the health now project um which jenny might talk a little bit about later um, so that's a national project where we're carrying out peer research, um, homeless health peer advocacy and developing alliances in three cities across the country. Um, we'd got our peer researchers trained up. Um, they were just about to go out and about and do some face to face peer research, peer research, sorry, and then COVID hit. Um, and we had to kind of really quickly realign what we were doing. Um, so we focused on how we could then make our methods flexible, varied, and also make sure that people's voices were feeding into decision-making. Um, one of the things that became really clear at the start was that um, because of the nature of the virus, plans, responses were happening really quickly, but actually there were very top-down decision-making and there wasn't much um, you know, lived experience or consultation on them. Um, apologies. So, so we had to, we wanted to make sure, and that was the, the main thing we wanted to make sure that these voices were feeding into decision making. But we also knew that it was going to be quite difficult to reach people and we'd have different barriers than what we would usually do um, doing face to face work. We had to really be flexible and use varied methods. So we didn't just do one method. We did telephone interviews. We did staff and volunteer daily diaries so that, you know, our teams could pick up on any issues that were emerging really quickly. Um, and we also began a project of citizen journalism where people who are experiencing um, homelessness from across the country could feed in using their mobile devices, which we made sure they had access to and um, kind of credit on, and they could feed in what was happening for them and their community. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure that we were still having in place is have a reference group 
that steered and helped to interpret the results. Um, so we had a reference group of people who had experience of homelessness to help us design and deliver the project. Um, and that was really key because as um, Olivia mentioned, one of the things that we did um, throughout the project was develop fortnightly briefings so that we could feed back what we hear in really rapidly um, and have them conversations live. We came together again at the end, so we're in the process of writing up the report now, but at the end with the strategy unit to deliver analysis workshops, um, one with people who've experienced homelessness and then a stakeholder analysis workshop. So again, we've got that element of ensuring that it's all um, understood through that lived experience lens. Um, and also one of the things that we managed to produce, which was a really useful tool, is um, a website which is specifically for people who were taking part in our citizen journalism project. So their reports feature, um, and I'm sure Jenny might put it in the chat, um, feature people's raw insights of what's happening to them. And if you have any time at all, I'd really recommend you, you listen to some of them reports. We've had some amazing audio reports, videos um, from people. Um, there's a one that's just about to go up about someone's experience of um, going to get tested for COVID. Um, and just some really invaluable insights that have came directly from people who are experienced in the system and reporting back live. Obviously, you know, as I said, there's a lot of challenges to work in this way, you know, overcoming things like the digital divide, um, which is an issue for both, you know, healthcare, but also our research methodology. So making sure people had support to use um, the tech that they were provided, that they had credit, um, and also during the pandemic, reaching those who were most isolated. Um, so a lot of the work that we do is working closely with partners. But, you know, if people are very isolated and aren't linked up with any of the homelessness charities or, or with support, then it's really hard to reach people. Um, and I think actually the community reporting element of this means that, you know, our community reporters can act as a conduit to find out about the stories of people in their community who are maybe not. Um, who don't have access to a phone or who are more isolated. Um, I guess one of the things that, um, in terms of what we found, um, we had really kind of, um, as we did through our, our briefings, we put that out quite rapidly, but some of the key issues that we heard about from the research um, was around this access to healthcare, specifically around access to primary care. Um, so we started to hear more and more about people who were not able to register at a GP, um, people whose appointments was changing and they didn't really know when they were changing to. Um, so having that kind of experience of limbo and in some cases that meant people just self-regulated, you know, stopped taking their medication um, because they didn't know when the next appointment was gonna be. Um, a real big issue that we heard a lot about was access to food um, and access to both kind of nutritional, but also, um, you know, appropriate food. So people would maybe get a food packet, a package that had something that you couldn't actually make a meal in and then they didn't have access to any cooking facilities to make it. So that was a real big issue. Um, similarly, access to things like hygiene facilities when day centres were closed, um, where they would, might have usually been able to get a shower and do their laundry. Um, and a real kind of variation across the country in um, kind of inconsistencies in how the approach was taken so a lot of areas you know quickly developed these um, multi um, agency task forces and, and had these plans put in place but other areas who maybe hadn't got them existing mechanisms in place it, it was really slow to kind of get that planning um, and make sure that people's needs were responded to um, similarly you know it was great that we we managed to get everyone in but um, the kind of support that people got through that process and when they were then in, you know, temporary accommodation was really varied. Um, so some people had a great experience of moving into a hotel, having their own access to, you know, hygiene facilities, food and clinical support, um, getting on um, prescriptions, which was, which was great. You know, some people who'd been in a hostel for 20 years. Um, and then in other cases, people were moved into a hotel with no wraparound support and then kicked out for, um, you know, potentially smoking or, or not following the rules of the hotel. Um, so a real varied picture across that. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, Jenny, about the about the research project or if to pass over to Fraser. 
yeah, Fraser. I'll let Jenny's you gesturing to pass over. I don't know where I am on your screen. It must be to your yeah, must be to your right. That's where you. That's where you're pointing. Um, Joe, I want to be in effect because we're by what horrible stereotype I, I don't know, but we we've been cast as the research nerds on this panel. So can I just give us a topic that I'd like us to come back to that Olivia mentioned, which is the kind of methodology wars question, which you must always count on things like this, um, which is the place of peer research within the sort of hierarchy of evidence for decision makers and how well accepted it is, how well understood it is, how valued it is, et cetera, et cetera. If, if we get time, I'd like to come back to talk about that between ourselves. Yeah, let's, let's, I'll make some notes while you're speaking. So that can answer that in a, <laughs> That's why I in, thought a research, in a research nerd way. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Um, Janine, shall I go? I'll let you know. Um, brilliant. I've got um, I've got ten minutes or so uh, to to tell you about the the work that we've done from the Strast Unit uh, perspective. Talk about four things. I'll say something about the origins of the work as we understand it. Olivia's introduced it from her perspective, but I'll I'll give you my account. Um, tell you a bit about the challenges that I think were inherent in the job that we were given and the approaches that we took to addressing them. And then finally, I'll just offer a few reflections at the end, one of which relates actually to the, to the question I think that Joe and I face. Um, so to start with the origins of the work, I mean, as Olivia said at, at the outset, the Strategy Unit got together with Health Foundation, with uh, King's Fund, with Nuffield Trust, and we kind of pulled an offer to the system to say we're going to coordinate our efforts because there's not, it's not as though there's a ton of unused good analytical ability out there, we should focus it and coordinate it, so, so we did. And our offer got to Olivia, I mean, we were attracted into the project both by her ability to galvanise people and bring people together around an agenda. So there, there was some degree of uh, personal charm effect uh, in there. But also, you know, we're really attracted to the topic. Health inequality is something that cuts across a ton of what we do. Personally, this is uh, a, a topic I care uh, a lot about. So it kind of matched our mission. It also matched... I mean, if we had a meta question during lockdown, it was something like, how do we know that what we're doing is any good or not? It was something like that across a whole range of different areas, primary care, we were being asked to, uh, secondary care, um, but also in, in relation to these services. So we were also interested in it methodologically. How do you work this stuff out? Um, is, was was one, of the, the, one of the questions that we got. So we were, we were interested in that. In effect, the questions we, we got given was something like, what was the policy intent in this area? What was government setting out to try and achieve? What did practice look like pre-COVID? What did it look like under COVID? And how would we know if some of the innovations constructed under COVID were advances, were any better or, or were any worse than what went previously? And so therefore, what should we do? We were also charged with uh, a sort of side project to, to try and work out what the data in this area <laughs> Was saying uh, and how it might be uh, how it might be improved which we thought was a little sort of side project but actually winds up being an, an enormous task and um, so that was the origins of the work and that was what we set out to do in terms of the challenges that we faced in doing it the first I think was the one that Joe has talked most about and, and Olivia as well which is about actually hearing from people affected by the changes firsthand and getting a, getting a strong sense of what their experience was like. I mean, just to be critical for a moment, you know, on, on sort of research world generally, my, my general observation would be that when uh, professional researchers seek to do this sort of stuff, they tend to do it really badly. Um, and the results tend to be quite tokenistic. They wind up talking to very small numbers of people and trying to make a whole lot out of very, very little. And I don't think that's necessarily because they're sort of bad at their job or less of them will be, or, or that they're not well-meaning. I think generally they, if you, if you assumed both of those things were true, I think often the, the problem is that the method, the, the methodological disciplines and processes try and actually wind up tripping them up on the way in because they don't have uh, some of the expertise and the, the subtlety that Joe and her team do. So that was one challenge. How do we hear from people affected? Another was the sort of what in research terms is, is generally pretty simple, which is to work out what on earth's going on. So normally that's a really, it's not trivial, but it, but that's normally one of the easier questions you face as a researcher, which is like, just provide me with an account of the way that the world is. And then we'll get to the tricky stuff of figuring out what, what we ought to do. Figuring that out was really tricky in this case because of the local variation Joe spoke about and because of the just sheer lack of data and information that Olivia referred to. 
There was then the, the challenge of figuring out, having, having established what was going on, figuring out whether it was any good or not relative to what went on previously. And doing that in the face of no evaluative information at all, a swirling context, very little data, very little information, and a ton of advocacy. So that was tricky. Um, <laughs> and then the final thing, again, just to be rude to uh, my research colleagues generally, is, is I've got this sort of bee in my bonnet about the way that researchers stray beyond their area of expertise. I would use researchers and analysts to try to get a strong sense of what is but I do not think they've got any special place in the world to try to say what ought to be. I think very often we move from a description of the world to an account of the way things ought to be. And we do that as researchers too easily. And I think there's a big pause in between, <laughs> which, which ought to be there. And I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a sec. So they, they were the challenges. I mean, the, the approaches that we took to get around some of those challenges, the first of hearing from people affected by the experience. I mean, our, our response to that was just to work with Groundswell. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, in the end, it's, it's, it's worked through beautifully and, you know, I, I would love this collaboration to continue. Um, but our sense was to work with people who've actually got genuine expertise in that area and not to sort of bumble in ham-fistedly and think you can turn your hand to it. You can't. You know, this is a specialist set of methods, a specialist topic, a specialist group of people to be engaging with properly. And so we why not work with the specialists? The challenge of figuring out what was going on, I mean, in effect, we, Jenny, I think you've, we've got the same metaphor here, haven't we? We've got the jigsaw metaphor. I mean, we, th we thought the job was to try to just gather as many fragments as you possibly could, and then to attempt to piece it together coherently. So it's something like attempting the jigsaw, but with the bits everywhere. I also think attempting that with no sense of the front picture, no sense of what the final article would look like. So we gathered together fragments from uh, the work of Groundswell, we undertook stakeholder interviews, we ran a snowball survey which we distributed out through different networks of uh, services providing uh, support for people experiencing homelessness, and we also ran sort of literature searches and gathered other bits of research that were going along. So multiple strands of research to try to gather information as to what was going on that we could piece it together. The challenge then of figuring out whether that was any good or not, or whether any of what we found was better than what previously existed. This is my, you know, back to my hobby horse about the role of researchers. I think we, we felt that our task was to provide that account back, to provide the sense of what we could see by way of, you know, assembled pieces of jigsaw, but not to really try and place much judgment on it. Instead, we thought our job was to help bring together different stakeholders, including some of the peer researchers that Joe described working with, to try to construct exercises that we would guide them through that they could then pronounce on whether they felt that it was a, an advance or not. We didn't think we were the, we were the people to do that. So we, we did that through, you know, different workshops, uh, including a sort of stakeholder workshop last week where we, we kind of forced people to, we were describing the most common changes that were made and we kind of forced them into a sort of three point response. Did, did they think it ought to be scaled up? Was it so good they thought you'd scale it tomorrow? Was it so bad they thought you would stop it? Or actually, do we need to know a bit more and should we study it? So we were trying to, we were trying to get judgments out of people and then trying to work through that subtlety. Final thing is just, just a few uh, quick reflections, really. The first is about doing rapid research under crisis conditions. I mean, at the outset of the, <laughs> of the work, um, the best analogy we could find was trying to do this kind of work in humanitarian situation. So we were trying to find out what the humanitarian sector does when it's attempting to piece together evidence under much more stressful conditions than the one uh, we were facing. But nonetheless, there are a set of challenges. There's a set of things that we as a research analytical community could usefully reflect on. So reflections about uh, what it's like to work with decision makers and with stakeholders when you really want to engage them in the collective act of sense making. When you don't think as a researcher you've got the possibility of going <laughs> ta-da you know here's <laughs> here's the finding here's here's everything that should be done because in the situation we were in we couldn't do that we had to collectivize that task of sense making and working through it and i don't think that's always sort of traditionally done or traditionally well done etc cetera, etc cetera. i would like to do more of it though uh, and th then the final thing is just about the requirement i think for researchers to collaborate better under circumstances like this. 
and to collaborate across sector and across method so that we can equip decision makers with the information that they need to, to do the job that, that, they, that they face. I think that's it. I think that was, that was the set of thoughts I'd had on it. Thanks, Fraser. That was absolutely fascinating. What is striking me about this is how difficult this is to do well and effectively and how complex it is and how important it is to not force traditional methods on into non-traditional environments and actually finding the complexity of finding the right components to get good research around a population around the homeless population is actually really challenging and yeah I'm, I'm blown away with what people have done with this it sounds absolutely amazing and I do want to go away and read the um, fortnightly monitoring briefings and have a look at the citizen journalist reports which have both been linked in the chat and we'll get them around after the session as well so thank you we've had some I'm just reading the chat we've had lots of really good chatting but it's been more signposting people to other things um, Olivia has just commented around working with experts is also true in winder engagement approaches and absolutely agree with that. The perception that voluntary and community sector organisations are biased and actually they actually just have a better perspective on the things that they're talking to people because they listen to people I think is really important and it is just the learning that we can take away around actually how we do this better in the future I think is really important and if nobody's got any burning questions for Fraser, I will be quiet and hand it over to Jenny who can wrap all of this up for us. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Fraser, for nicking my um, my metaphor. Um, so I'm gonna wrap this up by, um, by trying to kind of think about what are some of the key messages about what we've learned that could be taken away and, apply and applied elsewhere. So in effect, what I think this is, is about a methodology about how to create um, systems and processes to make better decisions about services, policy and commissioning. Um, so the key message for me is that everybody, look, look, everybody has a piece of the jigsaw. Every stakeholder is carrying a part of the picture about what's happening and also part of the solution and also part of the power. So every single stakeholder has that. So if you think about commissioners and policy makers, they hold the purse strings. Yes, that is the Gruffalo. Um, they hold the purse strings, they hold the contracts um, and also the monitoring. They also hold the big data. So they've got access to data across um, at a national level and they also have power over things, power over decisions that impact on every single other stakeholder around the table. And the providers hold the resources and they make decisions about how to use those resources in their own local area. And they have a unique understanding about the challenges that they face as providers and also some insight through their own sort of patient experience work about what some of the challenges that, that patients face. But the people who need services hold a really important piece of the jigsaw too. how and why services work and what doesn't work for them, why they're not engaged in a service or, or why um, they can't get access to it and what it feels like when a service comes to an end. But they also crucially face the impact of the decisions that are made by all of the other stakeholders around the table. And we would argue that peers hold a particular important piece of the jigsaw as well, in that they help bridge the insight between um, people who are needing the services and the people who provide or deliver the services. So these pieces of the jigsaw are impact 2020. These are the important things that need to come to the table. And what we did, um, well, what Olivia did actually, was bring the table so she brought the table and asked people to bring their pieces of the jigsaw to the table. And without a table, you can't put a jigsaw together. And that's an important thing. Um, so we, we came to the table with pieces of the jigsaw on behalf of people with lived experience brought by our peers. And the strategy unit brought the pieces of the jigsaw from the conversations that they'd had with providers. And Olivia brought pieces of the jigsaw to the table in, in terms of bringing commissioners and policymakers around the table as well. 
and everybody's piece of the jigsaw was valued on an equal basis. Some of them might have been bigger than others in terms of their power, but they were all brought to the table and looked at on an equal basis. And also it doesn't need research projects to bring pieces of jigsaw to the table. Sometimes it just needs a conversation. For example, we facilitated a conversation on digital and primary care where we brought those stakeholders to the table and we talked about it. Um, and it's important to bring all of those pieces together on the table because there's always pieces missing, that annoying thing where you get to the end of the jigsaw and there's an important piece missing and that important piece is the solution. Okay, so we all did the analysis, we looked at where the gaps were and we came up with a solution. So woo, this is the place that we got to and we created this solution together to fill in, oh this is, this is going to be interesting, oh to fill in the jigsaw overall because we all bring part of making the solution. Yes, it's very important to have people with lived experience around the table and we did that. Um, but what in creating the solution, we created the roadmap to show other people how to do that, how to deliver something differently. And what normally happens in those kind of research processes is that you gather all of that data and it's extractive. So they go, they take, take an opportunity to listen to all of the different stakeholders and particularly with people with lived experience, they extract those stories and they go and take it to a table somewhere else. And often the people who aren't around the table are people who have lived experience. So they might be involved in telling what the problem is, but they're not part of fixing it. And that's what's importantly different with this project is that they have been part of that. And um, so we set out the roadmap for others and often, in creating those solutions, which we like to call recommendations, that's where the process ends and everybody congratulates themselves, pats each other on the back, and then they go off to the next issue that they're going to try and solve. What's different about this is that the research doesn't end there. We're, we're committed to delivering the so solutions together and because we've got an empowered bunch of peers who are able to hold people to account for delivering the solutions that we've created together, supported by Groundswell, and we have the buy-in of Olivia and other policy makers, we're able to work together to, to deliver on those solutions and the commitment that we have is that the steering group will continue, we're going to come out with a joint group of, uh, set of, of recommendations from the two pieces of research and our peer reference group and our peers will sit on that steering group and support people over time to try and deliver the solutions that have been agreed between all of us. Um, so I guess in summary um, for this part I would say make sure that everyone's at the table so you have all the pieces of the jigsaw and you're able to fill in the gaps together. Um, the other key messages it's it's possible to gather views yes even in a pandemic even of people who are the most excluded from our society and that is possible through the power of peers um, and also you can't just stop at gathering insight, analysing it and, and cooking up solutions to it. There needs to be a way through which you enable those peers to, um, to have collective advocacy, to, to push decision makers um, to hold them to account for delivering on those solutions. So I think that's part of the lesson is that jigsaw um, and making sure that you have all of the people around the table. Um, and part of it is actually, I wonder how much of this gives us in, an idea of how to practically tackle health inequalities. Everybody talks about it being part of their role, but we have to break it down into a tangible process. And I think that process can be national, but I think it also importantly needs to be very local. And there's some, some ingredients that through the Health Now approach and through this particular piece of work for the COVID monitoring project with the strategy unit that we've done, that I think you, the lessons are create the table and make sure all the stakeholders are around the table at a national and a local level. What that means is bringing health, housing and homeless sector professionals together with, um, with people who've got lived experience in their local area. Empower them to gather insight, do that in a constructive way and use the power of the peer to get that. Bring that insight to the table and create and deliver solutions together um, and then enable people to hold decision makers to account. And I think that's the ingredient for tackling health inequality at a local level, but also at a national level. And I think this project has given us a, a means through which to do that. Does that summarise it? Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I think we haven't got 
Oh, we have. So we're starting to see some questions coming in. We've got a question that's come in that's asked, what is the role of creative and arts-based methods in your project? And we have another question, which is around, how do we hold decision makers to account? Is this through health and wellbeing boards, ICS governance? Um, how does that, how does this move from those core stakeholders who are invested around the table into kind of mainstream business, I think is the gist of that question. So I think, I, th I think we can op account. open this up to Joe. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, do you want to take the first one? Um, I'm not sure I was taking the first one. I, I was I just take the second one. The one that I was choosing. I was cherry picking. <laughs> Go for it. Um, yeah. So in terms of arts based methods, I think one of the things that we've found is, you know, the whole project, we wanted to make it as flexible and as, as having ways to get involved in any way that sees kind of suits people's needs. Um, and I think especially during a pandemic. Um, so having that mobile um, reporter element has meant that people are able to like utilize some of them you know their creativity and some of the things that you know is really therapeutic to them so there's a couple of instances so there's a, a video on the site actually which is an incredible video that both me and Jenny sat and, and had a little cry at um, which was about one of the reporters um, Jenny with mental health um, and they've done this amazing um, kind of video where they'd used a drone to shoot this footage and had this spoken word piece um, similarly, people who are putting in um, kind of photos and, and they're, they're having that flexible approach means that you're having that raw insight in a variety of forms, um, which I guess when it comes back to showing the value of, of peer research as well, it's really useful to have these different aspects and these different ways of showing people's stories um, because they really connect with people. Um, so as much as doing the kind of generic traditional telephone interviews, we really wanted to open it to us as um, kind of as wide a way that people could input as possible, whether that's a, you know, one sentence in a text or whether that's a, a 10 minute video of their experiences, um, it's got the capability to do so. Don't know if there's anything else anyone wants to add on, on that. No, no, but you're in my, you're in my methodology wars question. I am. The, and, and Olivia's point as well about um, very often you see uh, research on the experiences of, of people affected by a particular change done by the voluntary sector, you see it dismissed as advocacy or as anecdote. Uh, what's your response to that? You see I've sharpened the question now, haven't I? What's your, what's your sort of response to that charge? How, does, how do you get around that one? I think, uh, well, my background is actually, so I'm from an academic background. So I was really, my all of my research training has been very academic focused. And some of the reason why I moved into this sector was frustrations. Um, with the academic approach to research and you know I think part of that is having these constraints in place where you know people have to do research in a certain way for it to be seen as um, you know a representative sample and it needs to be seen in a certain way for it to have an impact whereas actually I found there's a lot more opportunity for impact um, doing research within this sector. I think some of the things around um, that you can get that you just couldn't get from doing kind of more traditional research, you've got that timeliness. So like you're getting that rapid raw insight that can be used to have an impact really rapidly rather than, you know, a peer research journal six months or a year down the line. That is really interesting and it might help, you know, advance the fields. But actually, if you want to have an impact on people's lives and an impact on policy and, you know, and system change, then that's how you do it. You have that raw insight and you also make it you know, working alongside people to make it answer questions that um, key actors want to want to know about. So it's not just about consulting with um, people experiencing homelessness, but as Jenny says, what is it that the system needs answers to and make yourself be able to answer them questions Then you show the value in it. And then I guess we also have that responsibility to promote the value of it because doing it well and working with people and, and things like this where we promote the value in it all feeds into that picture of making people see it in a different light um I think you know one of the things and this is this is a bit of a jelly point is that you know people's people's stories can't be dismissed um you know as much as you say it's an anecdote it's people's experiences it's happened um and a lot of the nuances and the the kind of the insight that we found from doing this project it's not just about 
you know, you could see that services have changed in this way, but how has it felt and why has it felt that way? And has it worked or not? You couldn't get from more traditional approaches. Um, so I think, yeah, having that value and making sure that your research is impact focused, but all, also highlights, you know, how, how patient experience feels um, based on, you know, service change. You can might give a map in more traditional methods that, you know, nine out of 10 people are, are happy with this service, but what's the one person and what's the reason that um, they're not happy with it? Um, Jenny? I was just going to chip in and say, like, I'm going to give all of the reasons that people dismiss the types of research that we do. It's not rigorous enough. You haven't reached enough people. That didn't happen. Um, or maybe that was a one off. That was an anomaly. Um, and also, um, oh, we've changed that since you did the research. So it, it's not relevant anymore. And for us trying to do national research, it doesn't have geographic reach. It doesn't have local relevance to my area and therefore I can dismiss it. I think the, the answer to that that Joe has said, just to summarise, is everybody needs to be around the table in the design process um, so that those things can be surfaced at the beginning and people feel a sense of ownership of the questions and, and the research process overall. Um, and the other thing is that sort of timeliness, you know, that's a challenge for our sector to be able to turn something around so that we don't take six months to produce a report. Um, and that was the benefit of this really, was being able to do that in a, in a really quick way. Um, and I think that, you know, for decision makers, you can't have it all. You can't say that you want views um, and you value views and then dismiss them because they're, they're not gathered in the way that you want. Um, and I think the way to do that is by, by developing sort of collaborative approaches with people with lived experience around the table because they will challenge. Can I just jump in on the accountability question that's in the chat box? Because I think all of that is providing the underpinning as to how you can then hold people to account. So, you know, different actors within the health and care system have legal and statutory responsibilities so CCGs have a statutory responsibility a duty to address health inequalities um, how often have you had a conversation with your CCG about what actions they're taking to do that and to deliver on that uh, because I don't see those conversations happening um, so how are you using the sort of the legislative framework to, to hold to account underpinned by the real experience that, that you have the evidence of that's spoken in the voice of those people. So all too often we see we see case studies, we see patient stories, all the rest of it, and they're really sanitized. They're written in system language because we've changed the language to make it professional rather than using the words that people have actually spoken. Um, and there is something about the power of amplifying people's voices in their words, in their language, that that we need to be, we, we really need to be true to. Um, but I think it's also that, you know, part of the accountability is this isn't just the, the formal systems accountability, it's everybody's accountability. So, you know, the voluntary sector are not perfect. Um, the voluntary sector, I've heard some horrific stories of a hostel that turned off the Wi-Fi in people's rooms whilst they were self-isolating because it was a safeguarding risk. I'm sorry, where's the safeguarding risk in some an adult having access to Wi-Fi whilst being locked down in a room with nothing else to do? So we have to look at ourselves, we have to look at our own practice and we have to be solution focused. It kind of goes back to Jenny's piece about how you build those solutions together um, and to do that, you need to get buy-in. So this isn't just about holding politicians to account or senior decision makers to account. It's how do we create that movement where we come together with agreed shared outcomes that we all can buy into. Um, and then you start to get some movement. Right, can sorry to interrupt. I'm going to give Jenny 30 seconds because okay. we're very so almost out of time. So a really practical example of that accountability at a local level, um, Sabah, Sabah is on the call and she's from Birmingham. So Sabah is um, in a role of trying to bring together homeless and um, health professionals to come up with solutions to health inequality in Birmingham. And this is supported by our Health Now Alliance, which is peer led. The peers set the agenda, they raise the questions and they um, 
are helping to craft solutions alongside SABA and that feeds into the Health and Wellbeing Board and the ICS and the STP sort of structures. And a practical example of that recently is that they got a presentation um, at the request of the peers on um, on nutritional standards and, and malnutrition and people experiencing homelessness and through the the Health Now Alliance meeting with all of the different sectors around the table they agreed to set up a task force and they're now discussing what actions can be taken at a local level. They've also met with the Deputy Director of Public Health to raise concerns about access to testing for people who are experiencing homelessness. The peers set the agenda and the peers hold stakeholders to account for answering the questions that they have have on behalf of the people that they've spoken to um, and I think there's some really good examples of that at a local level that accountability works if you invest in peers and you invest in insight and you have buy-in of all of the stakeholders so that was taking Olivia's stuff and making it really practical at a local level and Saba's so, just put in the chat there <laughs> I'm glad I haven't misrepresented it Saba it's really very exciting I stuff can I just come in and say a huge thank you to all of our speakers, Joe, Jenny, Olivia and Fraser. Can, can everybody give them a virtual clap just to say thank you so much. It was really good. It was I've learned so much. It was absolutely fascinating. Unfortunately, we are out of time um, and it feels like the chat really is just starting to get going. So I'm really sorry to cut people off. Can I just remind everybody on the call that this is part of our festival. We've got some more brilliant sessions coming up this week. We've got the trauma of COVID-19 tomorrow. We've got health inequalities and ethnicity on Thursday. And on Friday morning, we have got a panel session, which includes Professor Muir Gray and Dr. Farzana Hussain discussing what an NHS that is really focused on health inequalities would look like. And we have, we are hoping to run a one hour interview about inequalities and health with um, Hashi Muhammad, the author of People Like Us, um, which is, we've got a link to the Guardian article on that in the chat um, in the afternoon. So have a look at our website, keep an eye on the events that we've got coming up and hope to see you at some of our other events later on in the week. And again, a massive thank you to Joe, Jenny, Olivia and Fraser. Um, fantastic piece of work. Um, do um, grab the links through the chat and go and have a look at um, some of the things that they talk to around the um, personal the personal stories and the two weekly briefings that they were producing. I'm sure there's loads of really, really good information in there. Thank you so much.